speakers, welcome. Please take a seat. Today we're going to be talking about future generations. What are future generations and why should we fight for their future? There are amazing young people walking in now who I know are working for future generations. And I think everyone in this room is here because we want to generate positive change. It's the third day of change now. Who was here on the first day? Can I have a show of hands? Great. Second? Lots of us. Fantastic. And who's come on the third day just for today? Great. Amazing. Well, welcome to all of you. Today, we're going to have a keynote speaker, we're going to have a panel, and we're going to have a fireside chat. So I hope you stay for all three segments. My name is Ines Yavar, and I firmly believe that when we take action, it's not just for ourselves. It's for future generations as well. It's for those who come after us. If I ask you to think about your ch children, or your nieces, or nephews, or you when you were younger, I'm sure someone comes to mind. Those are the people we're taking action for today. It's not just for us. We want to work for a possibility of dignity, of peace, of love in a world further from today. But who are these people? In the year 2100, Africa will be home to half of the global youth population. So when we're talking about the future, it's not just us in France today. It's those who have been most left behind in the past. The investments that we make today are not just for our immediate needs, but they're critical for nurturing the dreams and potential of future generations. So, whether you'd heard of the topic future generations before or not, I hope you will join me today in a conversation that you will take beyond this space to other people in your lives as well. And to do that, we're going to start with one of my favorite people, Francisco. He is a Colombian 14-year-old defender of human rights, especially the human right to a healthy, clean, and dignified environment. He's the creator and promoter of Eco Esperanza Concepts and founder of Guardians of Life Movement. He is also the author of a book called Ask Francisco, What is Climate Change? So I will leave you with this inspiring young changemaker and see you in just a bit. Francisco. Welcome to the stage. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Bienvenido. Gracias. Dejo la escena. Pues muchas gracias. Well, uh, good morning for everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you today. Uh, one more year again here in the Change Now. A really great opportunity to um, share experiences, to share solutions, to share, um, well, well, uh, many, many things, no? Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to, to precisely talk from my view, from the view of my generation. No? I think that that's a key point, no? Because here, if you uh, look around you, you just will, will see uh, adults, no? People who uh, is a bit old, let's say, no? <laughs> to be respectful with, uh, with everyone, no? But uh, actually, I think that we miss that energy, that encouragement of the children, precisely, of the youngest one, which uh, have that uh, ideas, that energy, and, um, and, and that one to make the change, precisely. That one to make the change now, how he are says, no? Uh, that one to be heroes of change, that one to uh, really be part of the conversation, of the table, and say what we think and how we believe that the climate crisis has to be a treat, basically. So I will start by uh, present introducing myself, basically. Ines has already done it, but I want to tell you that uh, I'm 14 years old. I'm from Colombia, uh, and I found a movement called Guardians for Life when I was uh, nine years, basically, a long time ago, actually. And during, uh, <laughs> during I, I, I know that actually I have been uh, live for many time, but in the in my uh, in my my uh, short life, I have lived uh, many things, actually. <laughs> and I have been able to, for example, learn from nature, from um, also not just learn from nature, but also, also act for nature, I think. Uh, act together and collectively 
for our planet and for our future. I think that that's uh, the, the task that as generation we have. Uh, as a society, we have too many problems, actually. Uh, and in one year, I have changed many things, actually, have happened many things. Uh, we see the reactivation of many conflicts, armed conflicts, many wars, and uh, also many other problems that uh, come again to our society from in just one year. In just, in just one day, imagine what can happen. In just one day or in just uh, some hours, the world can be uh, fully destroyed basically by weapons. No? So imagine what can happen in a year precisely. 365 days. It's amazing, no? And what I want to say is that our uh, current context is a very difficult one. No? We have to uh, face wars we have to uh, face with the uh, men's challenge of make the peace, of deal the peace uh, among the parties, among the different uh, people who think different and who maybe cannot solve their problems through the dialogue. Uh, but also we have, for example, the climate change, we have the uh, lack to access to water, we have many problems. And those problems, what make to us is to uh, create inside us eco-anxiety. No? Maybe you have uh, heard a bit about this concept, no? eco-anxiety. No? That, um, let's say, that a nervous, that anxiety that uh, produces us uh, the fact that we don't know what will happen tomorrow. We don't know that if the world will uh, cease to exist tomorrow. Yes? It's something very... Um, alarming no, in our society and overall in the uh, youngest ones because they are the ones who will um, have to face the, the worst part of the climate change and of these problems, basically. When we talk about the climate change, we are talking not just a, of a problem of the future. If it is actually a problem of the present and even of the past, we... we, we uh, should take the actions thinking precisely on now, on the change now, precisely as, as this event is, is called. Uh, so that what, what I want to say and when I, uh, where I want to arrive is uh, to say that to contrast that eco-anxiety, we have to have eco-hope precisely. Is the invitation that today I want to extend to you basically to have eco-hope, the eco-hope as a solution. The eco-hope as our society also takes, um, takes many things from nature. We inspire ourselves from nature, no? We have too many examples, but the first one, for example, that comes to my mind when we are talking about inspiration on nature is the architecture, no? It's a look at, your, at, at our buildings and our way to planify the cities, the streets, no? We inspire ourselves on nature precisely. I live in a city, which is Barcelona, which is in front of the uh, coastline, in front of the Mediterranean Sea, and there um, is, is a very interesting, uh, or there was a very interesting uh, artist architecture that is Gaudí. No, maybe you have uh, heard about uh, Gaudí. No, he's like the um, most iconic person of the city. Gaudí precisely took a lot of inspiration on nature, from nature precisely. It was. He, he was insp inspired by nature. And for example, he has a very interesting phrase that uh, resumes what I want to say very uh, easily, that says, the nature is like a book. Imagine a book. Imagine, uh, I don't know, every, uh, one, any book. It's like a book, but a difficult one. But we have to make an effort to understand that book basically, because on that book is our future, precisely. On that book is our survival. It's as simple as that. So the nature gave, give us everything, give us the air, give us the um, medical uh, elements that we need to survive, give us uh, basically all the resources that we need to, um, to survive as, as humanity, basically, no? Uh, but Instead, while, while, while the nature is giving us everything, we don't give anything to nature. And on the contrary, we harm the nature, no? That's the problem. We are a, li a little bit like, how to say it, um, uh, disgraceful with nature, no? 
we maybe don't uh, think precisely on the other. I think that that's the problem. We are talking about climate change, we are talking about wars and problems that uh, create us eco-anxiety. But where these problems come from? I think that they come from a, a simple um, question, and is the uh, lack of empathy, the, the, and something else, the, 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 I don't know, like the attitude, the uh, instinct that the human beings have to believe that they are superior to the others, yes? It's a bit that what have with nature. We live in an anthropocentric society that believe that uh, we are more than the nature. And in that sense, we are allowed to exploit it, no? And not just happen with the nature. It also happened, for example, with the women and the men, no? Or with the adult and the children, precisely. That, uh, that uh, question of the superiority that we have as human beings. So what I want to say is that the problem no, is not the climate change itself. Per se, is not the climate change the problem, actually. The problem is the way how we uh, develop our safe, ourselves, the way how we um, relate with the nature and with the others, no, as a species. Uh, and also, in general, I would say the, um, our mentality. Our mentality is the real problem. A mentality of, uh, of thing that we are more than the other I have, as I have already said. So uh, how can we solve that? For me, there is a very simple solution, and the first step to do is to have willingness, no? to really want to do it. If we really want to do it, I think that we can get it. It's a question of willingness. Maybe there are many other issues, as for example, uh, arrive at consensus, no? but in this city we have, for example, a very great and important consensus, which is the 1.5 degrees. Don't, uh, don't, don't allow that the temperature uh, is more than 1.5 degrees, precisely. So if, if we really uh, have the tools to arrive at the consensus, so why we don't do it, no? Why we is not possible to, to, yes, to have the willingness, because there is a lot of interest uh, in, in the nature precisely and on the climate uh, change and on the different uh, problems that we have. For example, the money is a very big interest that we have uh, in our society, no? And that uh, move us basically, I think, no? For example, think for just a moment how many money has been spent on the world, in, on every single world. We are living in the highest level of violence since the, fin since the end of the World War II. Imagine more than 50 armed conflicts are active right now. So how many money is being spending on all those conflicts? And how many money, on the contrary, is being spending, for example, for solve existential threat, how the climate crisis is for us? Is that, that's it what the Secretary General Antonio Guterres has uh, said, that the, the war is just a, a distractor of our real and actual uh, threat. The threat and the, and the priority right now is the climate change. Of course, we have too many other problems to solve as a society. The economic development, the um, equality, no, and fight against the inequalities, fight for a more inclusive, inclusive uh, society, but the priority is the climate precisely, because the climate crisis is not a crisis of just, the, um, inc of just increasing the temperature. It goes beyond that. It, it restrengthens our survival, our exi existential, uh, our existence, sorry, in this planet. And not just of the people who is here. In fact, I think that uh, you, in some years, to be uh, sincere, to be honest, uh, you will not be here in, in I don't know, in maybe uh, some decades. Of course, uh, maybe you will have uh, a long life. But what I mean is that the ones who really will suffer the consequences of the 
actions and of the way how the past generation has uh, have at are the youngest ones, precisely. And for example, I'll give you a very interesting uh, fact. The 88% of the uh, different, um, I don't know how we say, say it in, in English, I'm learning English, I'm not the best in English, but in Spanish is enfermedades. How do you say that in English? The six, that's it. The six, thank you for the help. It's very nice to interact with you, Andians, no? The six, produced and caused by the climate change are impact on children. The 88% of the six produced by climate change impact on children and on children that are less than five years. No? And do you know, for example, how many money of the uh, multilateral uh, climate change funds has been uh, lead to children? Less than the 2.4% of the total amount. So it's, it's really disproportionate, no? It's really re re disproportionate while children are being the most affected and the most vulnerable ones, and why we, didn't, we, we don't take care of them precisely. We don't take into account what they have to see. And I think, to say, sorry, and I think that the, re the children really have a huge potential to contribute. In fact, we want to do it. There is like a, a conflict among generations, no? We uh, are all the time blaming each other, saying that is uh, your blame, is mine. I don't know, I think what, what I know I'm, of what I'm sure is that we have to solve those uh, conflicts and arrive precisely at consensus through the dialogue. That's it, a, a intergenerational dialogue. Maybe the, the youngest ones, the, the young people, the youth, the children, have, haven't lived enough, and we don't know everything. We are learning precisely. We are learning, but maybe we have the energy, as I was uh, telling you at the beginning, no? So what we have to do is to cooperate, to collaborate. If we miss something, maybe you can give that to us. And if you miss something, as that energy and as that encouragement, we can give you to you, no? We can give it to you, sorry. So basically where I want to arrive is that uh, this is a problem of everyone. We live on the same line, on the same air, and we are under the same uh, sky. So we solve this or we see <laughs> it's as simple that we will have to uh, face the, uh, the six mass extinction of, the, of our planet, that our planet has uh, seen. And it's uh, really sad, no? Think that the next generation will not be able to see our, the, the drivers, the, the beauty of, the, the, of this planet, no? This, the seas, the trees, it's really sad to think that your grandchildren, if you have children, or if you are thinking on uh, have children, will not be able to see all that precisely. So it's our moral duty to guarantee children to have a future precisely. Two years ago was recognized by the uh, General UN the UN General Assembly the right to have a dignified and sustainable and clean environment. So here I want to reivindicate that right and emphasize on the importance of also thin on the climate change as an integral problem. The climate change, I always give a single example, and it's imagine a box, a box, where is the climate change? Imagine that here is a box that contains the climate change. So inside that box is the climate change, but that box is not closed, it's open, and it's connected with many other boxes that represent the, the, the problems that as society we have to face. The health, the pandemics, the, uh, the wars precisely, the climate change is interrelated with those many other problems. So we have also to solve thinking on that and thinking on something very important that are the human rights. No? Also, I want to uh, talk a bit about it, the, the importance of seeing the climate crisis as a human rights crisis. The, uh, the climate crisis is also um, something that intensifies the, uh, the, the, the violations against 
the human rights, but also especially and particularly against the children's rights. So uh, it's very important to also assume, address these climate issues, thinking on the rights that are going to be affected by the problem, and also thinking on how can we solve the problem through rights, precisely, through the, uh, the recognition of the rights to have a dignified environment, who, 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 which has already been recognized, or through, for example, the recognition to have a right for a future, yes? To have a, a, the right to have a dignified future. That would be a very interesting uh, discussion on the high-level political events that in our world are happening, no? The generations have a right to uh, see also, as I, has, as I have told you, see the beauty of our planet. So we have to guarantee them that. And to finalize, because I don't have uh, already too much time, uh, I just want to um, give you a final message of precisely as I have a star of eco-hope. Eco -hope. Uh, do you know what is a exponential power? It, the exponential power is, imagine for example, or, or look at this uh, glass of water. This water uh, is multiplied by two, and then they are four, then they are eight. Yes, that's exponential power. So let's create an eco-hopeful exponential power. I think that the eco-hope can uh, be our driving force to face all the challenges that create us eco city to precisely guarantee that right to a future to the next generation. So I really thank you and uh, uh, yes, take into account that a eco-hopeful uh, attitude to address all the issues that we have as humanity. Thank you. Gracias. A huge round of applause. As you can tell, we could probably hear Francisco all day, but we have another panel coming up with incredible speakers, which I will invite on stage in just a minute. We have someone who calls herself a granny activist. So we've gone from a 14-year-old to now someone who's at retirement age. We've got the Future Generations Commissioner of Wales, whose job is to take care of future generations. And we also have someone who's using innovation and serving um, young people to know what they want for the future. So I will ask you to welcome them on stage, our next three speakers. Welcome, welcome. So I know you all, but just for a brief introduction for those in the room who don't, I'm going to read a little bit of a bio, um, but then if you'd like to introduce yourself further through the questions, you're welcome to do so too. So on the end, we have Derek Walker, who's the second Future Generations Commissioner of Wales, the only country in the world with a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And he has extensive experience working to support people and communities and changes organizations focus to development the needs of current and future generations. Welcome, Derek. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. <laughs> Lovely to have you. We, next to him, we have Anu Harki with a PhD in biotechnology. She is an Emerita Research Director, and a year before retiring in 2015, she trained as a climate speaker in Vice President Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. The reason for her activism is that she was in the food and ingredient and forest industry, and in both she realized the vulnerability that they have to climate change and wanted to generate change based on knowledge. Anu, welcome to you too. Finally, we have Maureen right here on my right. She is the executive director of the Higher Education for Good Foundation, and she is also the director of Youth Talks, a groundbreaking initiative, and is a professor of Schema Business School, holds also a PhD from Polytechnique Montréal and a master's in political science from the University of Montréal. Welcome to all of you. So I'm going to start with you, Derek, on the end. Will seems to have known before us all that we should think about future generations. Most of the world doesn't even think about them today. 
you, soon you will be celebrating the 10th year anniversary of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which allows public bodies to look towards the future in a more integrated, diverse, and long-termist way. So why did your country decide it was necessary to think about future generations' well-being? Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, we weren't the first country in the world in the sense that this kind of long-term thinking has been in cultures around the world um, ever since there has been humanity. Um, but what happened in Wales was uh, a moment, I think, when we felt that we weren't doing enough to address the long-term challenges of our country and we needed to do more. And we recognized we had a responsibility. We used to be the largest coal exporting port in the world in Wales. So we had a responsibility to do something about um, some of the important issues we would played a key role in being responsible for causing. So it was the time of the SDGs being agreed at the UN level, um, the COP Paris conference. There was a moment in time and an opportunity to put in place legislation to um, embed the, the SDGs. So we're the, still the only country in the world to legislate for the SDGs, as I understand it. And we, um, we ensure, we oblige our public bodies to, to, get, to deliver against the, well -being, uh, uh, against the SDGs. And we call them the seven well-being goals in Wales. We put them into our own language. And so um, that happened, and ever since then, we've been on a journey as a country to deliver against sustainable development. Um, part of why this happened is because we had some really strong leadership in Wales that recognized that they wanted to lead a legacy, leave a legacy, our first minister at the time, wanted to leave a legacy to make sure that we were doing the right thing for future generations to come, for grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And so the legislation is there, it's making a difference, it applies to public bodies, um, and we have 50 national indicators to tell us how well we're doing. Because if you don't measure it, you, it doesn't make a difference and um, perhaps people don't act upon it. So um, it's at the core of how we approach governance and decision making in Wales. Hmm, that's fantastic. And I mean, maybe we should take a step back first, Anu, and think, why should we take action? What's actually at stake? Why do we need to protect the planet for future generations? So could you tell us a bit more about that? Well, yeah, thank you, Ines. Uh, we have been burning fossil fuels for since the Industrial uh, Revolution for almost 200 years. And the burning gases, they are concentrating to the upper atmosphere, hindering the back reflection of sun's thermal energy. This is why we have the climate crisis in Francesco's words. And this is why we have to act on it. We know that the next generations will have a very different life from ours. If we are only looking at Europe, there will be shortage of food, shortage of sweet water. There will be millions and millions of climate refugees in our countries. And this is something that we are giving as a, as a present for the next generations. So this means that the retired generations and all grown-ups, we have to do something. We have to react on this to take care that the life of the next generations is as rewarding as ours. And happily, we have all the solutions in our hands. We can change our energy consumption to wind, solar, partly nuclear. We can have a sustainable food production by merely eating much less meat and more plant-based foods. We can stop consumerism and we can recycle more. And the only thing that we don't have currently, we don't have enough grown-ups who realize this and understand that it's their impact or their very much their responsibility to react on this and take care of the lives of the future generations. Mm. 
you were just saying a lot of people don't realize. I think the category that I fit in still currently is young people. How many young people are in the house right now? Show of hands, can someone make some noise? Are there young people in this house right now? Oh, come on, people aren't awake. <laughs> Great. So I think young people are really, truly taking action and showing example on this topic of future generations. Maureen, you led a survey for young people where you were asking them, what are you willing to give up to build that future? Could you share some insights of what young people have shared and how they're building that better future too? Thank you, Ines. Before going there, um, thank you very much for being with us today. And thank you to Francisco for this amazing speech just before us. Um, I'm the CEO of Youth Talks. So Youth Talks is today the largest youth consultation ever. What I want to do when I will leave that stage and when you will leave that session, I want you to want to go on the website to explore the results of this amazing consultation. Because we had 45,000 young people coming from 212 countries and territories sharing with us one million ideas. Yes, you heard well, one million ideas. Why? Because we asked them open-ended questions. So we did not impose a mindset on them. We did not impose our mindset. We made sure that they can express freely and talk about what matters for them. So yes, we had like very striking results. And one of them was the tension between regions or countries. But maybe the most striking one was when we asked these young people um, to reach out the future that you wish for. And they, they had to think to that kind of questions before because the consultation was 11 questions long. So they, they had to think a lot what they wish for themselves, for the world, what they are willing to give up, what they are not willing to give up and why. And one of the last question was, what do you need to learn at school to reach out to this future that you wish for? And they answered something that we did not expect at all. And if we had to put boxes after that questions, imposing that mindset, we wouldn't put that box. All of them worldwide, all of them answered, can we please, please relearn how to live together? Can we please relearn how to have more respect, solidarity, empathy, open-mindedness, you name it. That was the top first priority. Meaning what? Meaning that these young people probably realize something that we don't. They realize that with the technology, with the climate change issues, et cetera, et cetera, what we need first is to act as a collective to be, again, that human collective going forward, going in the same direction. And that was striking. And I don't want to tell you more because of the time and because I want you to get to go on the website and explore the results by yourself. but. The other priorities after that one were like environmental crisis. The second one was like environmental education. So first, relearn how to live together, then environmental education, then practical skills like how to cook, uh, uh, financial literacy, um, surviving skills, maybe the pandemic has to do with, with this. Um, and then yes, like teamwork skills, soft skills, and way behind you will find like management, engineering, mathematics, or even technology. So it is striking and I think that we definitely need to listen to them because they can see things that we cannot, they have that clean slate that we don't have, and it can definitely help um, to go in the right direction. Thank you, Maureen. I think you set the stage. Young people want to take action and are taking action as well, but we can't do it alone, Derek. We need governments, we need public institutions to do it with us too. So how has Wales, Wales delivered for future generations and what can the rest of the world, even outside of this room, learn from the Welsh story? Well, that's the key question, isn't it? It's not just good enough to have good legislation and have the only future generations commissioner in the world. It needs to be making a difference. And it is making a difference. My job is to be impatient about that change and to push for further and faster change. Uh, but we can point to, to success. I think one of the most important things that we see, though, is a different approach to decision making, a governance framework that thinks about the long term every day rather than just on an occasional basis. So that's really important. Um, but some examples of what's changed in Wales. So we've had a big change in our transport policy. 
from two thirds of our budget being spent on roads, transport budget, sorry, not the whole budget. Now we have one third of our budget spent on roads, the rest spent on public transport and sustainable transport like cycling and walking. We have the third best recycling rates in the, con in, in the world. Um, we have a change to our curriculum, a big change to our curriculum, so that young people are prepared with eco-literacy and the skills that we need for the long term. Um, so less about subject knowledge, more about transferable skills. So these are all um, the types of changes that are happening in Wales. Our model is not a, a lift and shift kind of model. It works for Wales. Uh, it might not work in other countries. We're humble. We try to be humble about the progress that we're making. But there is a practical model that we have here in Wales, uh, not here in Wales, in Wales, um, that we can, we can share and hopefully will be of benefit to other regions and nations around the world. I'm sure it will, and it already is. But Anu, Derek and Maureen have just been sharing how they're taking action in their jobs. But I think you can take action at any age in life. We saw it with Francisco, and now you also in retirement. Um, in creating the activist grannies after leaving the workforce, you've continued to share knowledge and also to learn in the actions that you take. Why do you believe that change is based on knowledge? Well, like, like you said, I've, I've spent my career in uh, food ingredient industry and forest industry and, and research institutes for agriculture and food economy. So, so I have a lot of background on these issues. And uh, I have to say that getting all this knowledge, it actually it changed my attitude to the future. I realized what will happen if we don't act on climate now. And uh, that's why I became a climate activist. And since retiring, like, like you said, I have been training to a climate speaker in Al Gore's climate reality. And uh, I've been giving like tens and tens of climate presentations in Finland for different kind of audience under six years time. And uh, I have learned that when I discuss with the audience after the talks, I have learned that people have often a very biased understanding of climate change. People don't really understand that it will be a crisis. And that's why I have heard that people after my presentations, when I uh, tell the same things that Al Gore is telling in his speeches, all the harsh things, they come and tell to me that, okay, I have to do something. I didn't realize that it's so important. So I think it's, it's, it's very critical that all grown-ups, not necessarily, hopefully, children, but all grown-ups should understand the crisis that we are facing if we don't act on climate now. Mm. And I think all the people in this room understand there's a crisis. Maybe it's a question of how do we go even further than that. And Anna was just talking about learning, Maureen. And that's a huge part also of your survey. We need to change the way we learn and start really creating spaces where that future can be created. So how should we transform education with future generations in mind? Yes, that's a, that's a very big question. I will do my best. Let me share with you a couple of ideas here. Um, first of all, so Youth Talks is about hearing the voices of the young people, collect these voices and analyze them, but it's also about making sure that it has an impact, right? So we have a network of about 70 partners now, including educational institutions, and we work with them to feed this transformation of the programs. I'm not sure if, and, and yes, let, let's remember one thing that's very important, that's the reason why we mainly work with these kind of stakeholders. Today's education is the future of tomorrow, right? We, we need to make sure that the way we will educate these young people will feed this new world that we all wish for. All right, so that being said, um, that's very important. I was wondering if we have professors or teachers in high school or university here in the, in the room. Um, I'm not sure if you 
noticed that, but the young people do not listen to us anymore. It's super hard to get their attention. And it's not because we are, I mean, not all of us are bad, so maybe, maybe I am. I'm a professor also, but it's not, I don't think it's because of this. Um, the way the world works today and their exposure to social media and to all this information is very different. A couple of years ago, we used to say, Yes, you have some information on the internet, but then you don't have the knowledge on the internet. And these days, you can access to a super class from the MIT or a very famous school with very famous teachers. Um, it's very easy to get access to that knowledge. So young people sometimes, they don't understand why they have to listen here to what you are saying. And I think that the value added is not here anymore. Uh, I like that, that thing saying, we need to go from um, sage on the stage to guide on the line. The teacher, the professor used to be in front of the classroom. These days, the professor needs to be in the middle of the classroom, listening to the noise they discuss with each other and that's fine. And we are here to guide them. I'm not saying here that we need to remove all the, the field like management engineering and we need to um, stop teaching them. It's, it's about supporting them in this journey. And I would like to finish maybe with this other idea saying, uh, centuries ago, we needed to learn with our hands, right? To grow vegetables and, and fruits. Um, for decades, we, we had to learn with our brains. Um, I think that in the future, especially because of all the technologies that we have, AI, generative AI, we will need to learn with the heart. This will be the added value for human beings. And if you think about one of the main results of this Youth Talks consultation, we need to relearn all these human values and virtues. This is completely connected. This is, this is what we need, right, for tomorrow. AI and technologies will do a lot of stuff, but we need to make sure that they do it the right way, that it is not harmful for the, for the other people, so that, that's what is at stake here. Mm, you're just talking about AI, and maybe I'm not the best person to ask this because Maureen was laughing earlier. I wrote my cue cards on a typewriter, so I'm like really old school. <laughs> um, but AI is a part of our reality now, and I know you're launching a survey on AI, so do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Yes, thank you. Very quickly. Uh, so young people in the first edition of the consultation did not talk at all about AI and technologies. This is not what came to their minds, like naturally. Uh, but, you know, we talk about this like every day in the media. So we were like, there is something wrong. We, ne we need to understand how they see that, like um, how they want to live tomorrow with this technology in education, all right, but also at work uh, and also regarding the planet and the future. So we decided to launch this new initiative. It will start uh, 10 days from now on AI, asking young people how they see themselves grow and live with AI. Um, so I invite you again to follow us. I would like to take this opportunity to um, tell my colleague here, first of all, we need to work together, uh, I'm convinced. And I would be very, very curious to ask our questions to the older people and to make comparisons between what young people think about this AI and what they think. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested, we should definitely do something because this is also about uh, closing this generational gap and try to understand who we are on this extreme and work together tomorrow. It is about intergenerational conversations and intersectional conversations. So I'm glad we're having it. I can see the timer, it's coming to an end, but Anu, I do wanna to come to you with a question on what can we do to generate positive change? We've talked about the problem, we've talked about um, what each of us is doing, but what can you motivate people here or even watching the recording to do? Well, yes. Um, like I said, uh, giving climate presentations, I think that's the most important thing for me as an activist because I have learned that people have to know. They have to realize what's happening. And all of you can join Al Gore's training. Those trainings are a couple of years around Europe and the US and Asia. And, and you know, you can go there. You don't have to pay for it, just, just for the hotel. <laughs> and I have learned a th two, actually two important things when I have given climate presentations. First one, talk reality. Tell the harsh facts, because have, people have to know. And then give the 
solutions, the, the rewarding solutions that we have in our hands. Mm. As, as founding member of activist grannies, we have, we have now in Finland close to 20,000 followers, activist grannies, mm -hmm. grandpops and, and granny-minded people. And it means that by time, we have now been working for four years, by time we can educate the old people in Finland so that they really know what's happening. Uh, we are organizing seminars. We invite experts to talk to our people and have discussions. We have Facebook and Instagram groups where we can divide good, you know, changes of life, how you can live a climate-friendly life. All these ideas, these people change with each other. And of course, biodiversity and nature restoration is one very important action point for us. One example is a joint collection of money with a Finnish Natural Heritage Foundation. We use that money to buy forests and uh, protect them for, for uh, permanently. We also organize panels for, for uh, politicians. Now we, we soon have a panel for the European, uh, European Parliament uh, candidates in Finland. And we are supporting those candidates who are for the Green Deal and nature restoration. So uh, all our members can see those panels and learn more about the, the uh, people who are candidates. Remember that people can change the world by voting. Remember to vote. And one more thing I have to say. I'm not European Climate Pet CEO, <laughs> I'm an ambassador, so there's a mistake there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Thank sure you. you could be their CEO too, but um, Derek, I know we're running out of time on seconds. I know you're hosting a Future Generations Forum in a month, and there's also the Summit of the Future in September. So what does success look like for you in the political space? And I'll close with that. Uh, just very quickly then, so we're hosting a Cardiff forum ahead of the Summit of the Future at the UN in September. And the idea is to think practically about what success looks like at the UN level in terms of impact. So what are the practical ideas that um, governments around the world can, can, can commit to at the UN in September? And, um, and to build some momentum behind this summit to make sure it is a successful and impactful event. Um, and what success looks like is, I think, clear. It, it's about us thinking long term and looking around and thinking, well, because we've acted, we've avoided those problems from occurring. And because we've looked to the future, we've um, harnessed the opportunities for current and future generations. So it's always keeping an eye on those outcomes for people today and for people in the long term, and not just about the process, but the impact that we can have. Mm, fantastic. And someone who's been thinking about that for a long time is coming on stage right now. So I'm going to thank you so much for having this conversation with me. A round of applause for our speakers, please. Thank you, Ines. Thank you. So. We're going to have President Laurent Fabius coming on stage. He serves as the president of the Constitutional Council in France since 2016. He previously served as prime minister of France from 1984 to 1986. And he was 37 years old when he was appointed. And this is the second youngest prime minister of the Fifth Republic. He's known as the father of the Paris Agreement. Many of you may have seen his picture gaveling the result of the Paris Agreement. And he's been pushing for future generations for long before many knew that it was a thing. So please welcome on stage President Laurent Fabius. Welcome to our stage. So, Future Generations is a new concept for some of us, but it's been present throughout your whole career. How did this idea come to be for you? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but it's, it's, it's a fact that uh, in my different positions, 
uh, have always thought about the future. And at the same time, uh, I am very much interested by not only the aim, but the way to go to the future. Because if you put an aim in the long term, in the long distance, but if you don't control the way, um, you are not in the market. Mm. Okay. Um, and when I was young, a few months ago, um, I, I read uh, a sentence by uh, Winston Churchill, and I want to tell it to you. Churchill said, the difference between a politician and a statesman is that a politician thinks about the next elections while the statesman thinks about the next generation. And I think it makes sense, particularly today. Therefore, um, it is true that, um, and especially in this changing world, uh, we have to take care about the present situation, but also have always a very close look to future generation. That's my story. Mm -hmm. And your, part of your story is COP21, right, in Paris. Yeah. Um, you were already thinking about future generations back then. How did that link to the Paris Agreement? Uh, in fact, uh, the concept of future generation is present in the preamble of uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, there are people here who have been with me in order to uh, build this success, because Paris, it was nine years ago, yes. Uh, it is the first uh, worldwide agreement uh, about climate change. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> we are not sure that it would be a success. It was quite a challenge. And it has been a success because we have been able at that time, uh, 2015, to bring together three different words. First, science, science, science. It's science and innovation. Uh, second, civil society. Change now is dealing with civil society. And three, the government. Uh, the international situation was much better than today. And therefore, we were able, and it was especially my role as the president of the COP, to build together uh, the different countries all around the world, and especially China, US, Europe, India. And uh, we are not sure that it would be a success till the end. Uh, the end of uh, COP21 in Paris was a Saturday, Saturday afternoon. And Saturday morning, I was, was not sure that it would be a success. But at the end of the day, uh, it was a success. And um, it's fascinating, fascinating because uh, today, uh, Paris, Paris COP21 is considered as uh, really the basis of uh, everything when uh, you speak about fighting against climate change. But uh, the actors themselves not all of them were aware of this. I remember, and I must and say that in a very low voice, that many of them were considering that the agreement that they are signing at that time will have no legal consequence. And today, as a matter of fact, it is the basis of our action. Therefore, always keep in mind that uh, we have to take decisions for the time being, but always having in mind the next generation, the future generations. Hmm. You were talking about science, the Paris Agreement, and I think young people are some of the biggest advocates for looking at science and looking at what's really happening to our world. And we're always telling leaders to stop gambling with our future. So how do you think leaders can act considering future generations and this demand that young people have? First, uh, they have to ask young people to participate in their decisions, which means that uh, 
leaders, and especially politicians, have not to be arrogant and to consider that because you are young, uh, you don't know things. No. Uh, a few minutes ago, we had a gentleman uh, who I is 14. Do. Yeah. I understand. Okay. Well, he's a bit old, but, <laughs> but, but he has started uh, when he was very young. And it's amazing because uh, he has an experience, he has a way to explain things. Uh, therefore, uh, I think uh, one, uh, your question was about governments all around the world. Uh, governments have to uh, be particularly keen to uh, what uh, the young people are saying. It doesn't mean that it is always right, but it is always meaningful. And uh, you have to have your eyes and uh, your ears open. Mm. So we've talked about young people, we've talked about politicians, but I know you also have a background in law. So can you explain the growing use of future generations before national, regional, and even global courts, especially in litigation and other documents? Well, that's a new thing. Uh, you know, today I'm the Chief Justice, uh, the, the President of our Supreme Court. And before, uh, well, I was in government and in the um, uh, National Assembly. Uh, but it is true that you have a new phenomenon throughout the world, uh, probably because people have not been satisfied by the decisions of governments, and especially in the field of uh, climate change. And therefore, more and more, uh, you have uh, cases coming to the courts. Uh, recently, it was um, in February, uh, in the, my court, uh, we had a worldwide meeting with about 100 judges coming from uh, every part of the world, and we discussed about this concept of future generation. And it was really striking, because uh, most of us now are dealing with uh, and acting uh, with these new concepts. It is true in France, but it is true in Germany, it is true in Netherlands, it is true in Latin America, it is true uh, in China, it is true uh, in India. And why? Because people uh, have been disillusioned uh, by um, the fact that um, they were, and there are menaces uh, against uh, our nature, and the answers are not enough. And therefore, naturally, they come to a court. It doesn't mean that they have always successes in the court, but the fact that uh, they are making a plea, uh, it makes people more aware of the phenomenon. And very often, uh, they are successful. Uh, and, the dis and, and, and more and more, the decisions which are taken uh, by the courts have an influence on uh, the reality of our society. Uh, as you may know, in a few days, uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, in Strasbourg will take a decision, I don't know what will be the decision, about an important case which is put by young Portuguese. In my court uh, in France, we have taken recently uh, in 2023, a very important decision about how to deal with uh, nuclear waste. And we decided, and there is a special sentence, that the decisions which are to be taken by governments and uh, by, by, by bodies, different bodies, must not only take into consideration the present uh, aspect of a situation, but also the interest of future generations. And this way of thinking is gaining ground everywhere, and uh, it has uh, concrete uh, impacts, because when a judge has decided something, uh, people and companies have to abide by the decision. Mm. And I know you hosted uh, 100 judges, I believe, from different regions and legal systems to reflect on justice, future generations, and the environment just now in February. Um, they were under Chatham House rules, I understand, but I know there's different ways to implement thoughts on future generations depending on countries and contexts. Is there anything you can share about that gathering with us? 
Yeah, uh, it was very interesting because the judges were coming from all the, all the world. Uh, the first thing is what I was saying a few uh, minutes ago, is that uh, in nearly every court, there is this growing uh, number of cases about climate and the feeling that uh, more and more uh, the judge is not only a judge for the present and the past, but also a judge taking into, con into consideration uh, the future. Uh, now, uh, in this uh, meeting, uh, there are at least two or three things that were, were very uh, important for me. First, uh, this concept of future generations is uh, not new to legal texts. Uh, it is present in uh, the United Nations Charter. It is present in the Rio Declaration, in the Rome Statute, in the Paris Agreement. And it, at a national level, this concept of future generation is enshrined in half of the world's constitution. It means that it is a very, very important uh, factor. Second, uh, obviously, civil society has a key role to play. And uh, I want to pay tribute, and especially in change now, uh, to the role of uh, civil uh, society and to the role of science uh, as well. And uh, this meeting of 100 judges uh, pays really a tribute to civil society as well. And third, because we were between judges, uh, we were aware that future generations raise several legal questions. First, who can defend future generations that do not yet exist? Uh, anyone at all? You can imagine the possible excesses. A dedicated defender, non-governmental organizations, Aboriginal people. Uh, in fact, young people are the most active players in defending the future, and particularly because they know or feel that their own future is under threat, and that they will suffer negative consequences of current action or inaction. But uh, this issue of access to the courts raises also, and we were aware of that in, in our meeting, the very sensitive question of judges' legitimacy at a time when uh, many people are talking about the threat, you have heard that, of a government of judges. Uh, my belief is that judges when they use the concept of future generation, and they are doing it more and more, are simply applying and interpreting current law to the specific context they are faced on. Therefore, I think that judges have, are not governments, they are not civil society, they have to stay in their own uh, competence, but everybody must be struck by the fact that in this field of fighting against climate change, uh, they are taking more and more importance. Mm. And we've been talking about judges, government, we, we could talk about the UN. I, I realized when I came on stage, I said I was Ines, no one actually knows where I work or what I do. <laughs> um, so I'm currently the Next Generation Fellow at the UN Foundation. And what we're doing is trying to influence also and support the UN and the work that they're doing towards the summit of the future. What would you like to see reflected in the Declaration of Future Generation that's coming up in September? And why should people care about these kinds of processes too? You mean the UN? Uh, yes, Summit of the Future uh, yeah. in September. Well, I think, uh, well, it will depend on the general situation around the world because UN is not apart from the mm. international situation. And I don't want to comment on politics because it's forbidden for me. Uh, but obviously, according to the result of the American election, things can be different. Okay, everybody understand. Uh, okay, but, uh, and we know that uh, it's not easy to have a strong uh, UN resolution. Uh, but uh, I am confident and am particularly uh, interested in um, this uh, meeting, why? 
because it is important to set a common framework uh, for decision uh, makers. Obviously, there will be resistance, but uh, I think the Summit of the Future, because it's, uh, its title, will be a good opportunity to bring together world leaders to forge a new international consensus on how we can deliver a better present and secure a better future. And uh, I hope that it would be an opportunity to demonstrate that international cooperation can address current challenges. Um, and um, in particular, I will add two comments. Uh, first, uh, there is obviously a deficit uh, towards um, a, a deficit of trust coming from the most vulnerable countries, and especially in the field of environment. And I hope that this pact, which uh, will stem from uh, the UN, uh, could help uh, to um, fight this deficit. And uh, I will add that, um, and it's a more general thought, I hope that you, you will share this thought, that when we, dis when we think about the major challenges of our time, and in particular the environment, um, all these challenges have a threefold characteristic. First, the main challenges are interdisciplinary. Second, they are international. And third, they are intergenerational. And therefore, uh, the hope that the pact uh, the future pact will be interdisciplinary, addressing not only climate and biodiversity, but also inter-related issues such as gender, peace, science, and technology. I think it is a step in uh, the good direction. Therefore, I know that it is difficult, but I hope that it will be an element to go in the right direction. Mm. And you spoke about trust, and I see the time yeah. is running out, but I do want to ask you a final question, um, because I think these kinds of conversations do generate trust. So I want to thank you for being a good ancestor for our future generations, but also ask you, how can we all be good ancestors for those that are to come? Well, you know, I know that I'm not very young, but ancestor, it's the first time. <laughs> that I'm, I'm an listening. ancestor too, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Maybe father of the Paris Agreement, okay. <laughs> Uh, no, I will uh, end by um, an anecdote. Uh, I had a conversation with Michael Bloomberg, okay, the previous, uh, the former uh, mayor of New York, and at, at, at the moment of, of Paris Agreement. And Michael Bloomberg said to me, well, Mr. Fevers, I uh, wish a good success, but be careful. Uh, there are two mistakes to avoid, okay? The first one, well, uh, is uh, to have a short-sighted view. You must have a long-sighted view, but uh, you must avoid when you are discussing about the future uh, to speak in a way that people think that there is nothing to do today, because it's too well, it's over term, and I think it's right. And one of the difficulties uh, in UN and in change now and all our action is to have a good balance between a necessity of long-term view but also a short-term action. That's the first advice of Bloomberg, I think it's right. The second one is about optimism and pessimism. Okay, let's be blunt. The situation of uh, climate is not a good one. We're off track. Without Paris, I don't know if you know that, without Paris Agreement, the trend will be five degrees. Five degrees. And today we are about three degrees. Mm. Okay, four in France because of its geographical situation. But it's too much. It's too much. It's always, it's already very difficult with 1.5, 1.6, 1.8. What about when it, if it is four degrees? And therefore, uh, there are elements of pessimism. 
But if you are pessimistic, people say, okay, there's nothing to do. I uh, put on the TV and that's all. No, it's not the way it can go. Uh, we must be lucid, but we must keep optimism because through civil society, through science, and through hopefully governments, uh, we can change things. And uh, I think the two, two advisors of uh, Bloomberg were right. First, have a balance between long-term and short-term action, and second, never abandon optimism. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, President Laurent Fabius. It's been great thank to you. share the stage with you. Thank you, dear. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who joined us today. I hope that you will take action in your communities, wherever you are. I mentioned, as part of the UN Foundation, we have an engine room for the future. You're welcome to join to take action towards the future. And now let's go away from this place and take action wherever we are in the world. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.